Hi, I'm Dan Blumstein. I'm a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology, um, and I'm in the department of uh, the Institute of Environment and Sustainability at uh, UCLA in Los Angeles. And today, what I want to do is talk about conservation behavior, a fearful perspective. Um, I'd like to say that a goal of conservation research is to make changes, and I think that a really good models for making changes come from thinking about what the National Institute of Health has in terms of philosophy. They have a bench to bedside philosophy where they have biomedical research that has clear human health benefits. And I think we can do the same thing with conservation behavior. Research that takes the fundamental insights from behavioral biology and ultimately applies them to wildlife conservation and management is what I consider to be effective conservation behavior. And I think that a theme of this um, is going to be mechanistic studies that allow us to predict how animals are going to respond to anthropogenic assaults. I have written about this in a textbook, and I've written about this in terms of thinking about ecotourism. And what I want to do today is take sort of a fearful perspective and focus on any predator behavior and tell you how any predator behavior creates lots of insights that can be used potentially to uh, apply to wildlife conservation and management. I think the key of all of this is that we have to take an evidence-based decision-making framework, that we have to use science and we have to design um, interventions to collect data that allow us to come up with effective management outcomes. Adaptive active management is management that uh, occurs where you do experiments, where you have controls and treatments and you have well-designed experiments and you look at the effect size. You look and see if your manipulations actually lead to changes that are effective. Now, often when dealing with endangered species, you can't really do that, or at least it's not politically tenable to do that. You know, can you do experiments where you know animals are going to die? Well, in theory, the best science comes from the best, best management comes from the best science, but you can adopt a passive adaptive management where managers use historical data or data from uncontrolled experiments to come up with best guess management recommendations. And the fate of these can be studied. I think, um, our goal in everything I'm talking about today is these are ideas that can be studied scientifically and uh, the effect size and the efficacy of them can be evaluated. So what I want to do today is talk about a lot of things. I want to talk about flight initiation distance, which is a metric to quantify disturbance. I want to think about the evolutionary ecology of fear and ask the question, why do animals not tolerate people? I want to ask more broad questions about where do animals feel safe? And I want to think about something I'm going to call, well, the distracted prey hypothesis, which sort of looks at an effect of anthropogenic noise above and beyond masking communication. I want to think about the natural history of habituation and the contiguous habitat hypothesis. And I want to talk about the multi-predator hypothesis and the evolutionary persistence of behavior and how we might uh, bootstrap that uh, in, in various ways. So, why am I talking about any predator behavior? What is any predator behavior? Well, any predator behavior are things that animals do to reduce the probability of being detected by a predator, attacked by a predator, or killed by a predator. And this includes all sorts of adaptations to detect predators, to identify them. It includes any predator vigilance, looking around for predators. It includes behavior, escape behavior, fleeing from them, and using refuges. And it includes behaviors communicating about predators, both to conspecifics and potentially to heterospecifics. Why should we be thinking about any predator behavior? Well, because there are direct effects of predation on populations and communities. Predation is a strong selective force that influences habitat selection and population persistence. Uh, I run a long-term study of yellow-bellied marmots at this place, the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory in Colorado. And we know that marmots persist in areas of good visibility and protective rocks. And they go extinct in areas uh, where uh, there's not good visibility. So predation is a, an important factor that influences population persistence. We also know, of course, that getting killed ruins your direct fitness. But we also know that there are a variety of indirect effects of predation risk on populations and community. Fear alone may influence where animals go and what they do. Fear may structure communities and the interactions we see. Fear may influence biodiversity. So there are good reasons to study anti-predator behavior. And we also know that for many uh, wildlife management uh, interventions, they often fail because of predation. We know that many translocations and reintroductions for conservation, putting animals back into nature or moving them around um, in, from one place to another to repopulate 
populations, to recover populations, or to supplement populations, many of these animals that are moved die. They, they die because they're killed by predators. So predation is a very important factor that is often associated with the failure of conservation interventions. And for that reason alone, if we want to improve our game, we need to think about any predator behavior. We know that animals change, uh, that humans change animals' behaviors. And I'm going to say that a key to understanding human impacts is to understand that many species view us as predators. Predators approach animals and animals flee and hide from them. And I've used this to ask a variety of questions about any predator behavior. So what I want to first talk about today is um, introduce you to this idea of thinking about the evolution or ecology of fear in birds. Why do some species tolerate disturbance while others don't? How can we think about this more generally? I'm going to use a really de deceptively simple metric, flight initiation distance. Flight initiation distance, FID, um, is the distance at which an approaching, an individual flees an approaching person. This is a method to quantify the perception of predation risk as animals perceive it, and it's a method that can develop data sets that can help us manage uh, populations and manage human disturbance. I developed a comparative data set with about 10,000 flushes on over 300 species of birds. Together with colleagues now, we, I don't know, we probably have 100,000 flushes on many, many more species of birds from, from around the world. And colleagues and I are using data sets like this to try to understand a variety of questions about you know, what explains variation and susceptibility to human disturbance. I have to say that this whole question um, became sort of interesting to me because when you put a hiking trail in, you start losing species. Well, why is that? What, what, what explains the differences in vulnerability to um, human disturbance? Just a hiking trail. So I started going down this route, trying to understand life history and natural history correlates of flight initiation distance. So an early study showed that flight initiation distance is kind of species specific. If you look at this graph, what you see is that the species that uh, are typically have high flight initiation distances at a variety of different places, typically have high flight initiation distances at a variety of different places. These are beaches around Botany Bay in Sydney. And species that are rather tolerant, um, allow people to get very close to them, typically are tolerant no matter where they're studied. And these, species, these locations were chosen based on having different degrees of human disturbance. So there's some species specific signature there. Yet we know from a rich literature that these are that flight decisions are adaptive decisions that individuals are making. And there's all sorts of interesting optimization going on in this as well. Nonetheless, there's a species specific signature there. So let's go with that. An early uh, insight that I had was that um, if you look at body mass and you look at the distance a bird first looks at you when you're approaching it, what you find is that big birds look at you at a greater distance than small birds. So large body sized birds detect humans at a greater distance. And it turns out that um, if you look at body mass and flight initiation distance, you find that larger birds also flush at greater distances. Now these are controlling for um, phylogenetic similarity of species using, in this case, independent contrasts. But um, colleagues and I have done many other studies of this. In fact, we've done meta-analyses where we've combined the results of many different studies. An early meta-analysis that Ted Stankiewicz and I did um, looked at uh, risk assessment in a, in a variety of different taxa. Now, what meta-analyses do is they calculate essentially weighted average effect sizes for many different studies. And they can handle phylogenetic relationships, and they can, uh, I think, are particularly useful because they allow you to calculate a variety of heterogeneity statistics. And these heterogeneity statistics identify groups that respond differently. So for example, in one analysis, we found that fish, but not other taxa, tolerate closer approaches as group size increases, which is interesting if true. And these are only based on published studies. So you, it, it pulls together all of the, the different published studies that you can find. So um, a colleague and I edited this book, and we invited Anders Moller to do a meta-analysis of flight initiation distance in birds. And what Anders concluded is that um, FID decreases with urbanization. Urban birds let you get closer to them, okay? Um, it increases with body mass, which is a, 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 something that I discovered earlier. 
And what I'm reporting here are these correlation values, the R values, it's a measure of effect size. So um, R goes between negative one and one, and closer to one, stronger effect, closer to zero, smaller effect. So bigger birds um, have greater FIDs. FID varies with predation risk. Um, so if in areas where there are more predators, birds flush at greater distances. Interestingly, we sort of fortuitously discovered uh, in, a number, in a previous study with Anders and some other colleagues that FID decreases as you get higher in latitude. And we hypothesize that's associated with um, greater uh, predation risk in the tropics and fewer and lower predation risk as you go further north, a pattern that's also mimicked with uh, nest defense uh, for nesting birds. More social birds uh, tolerate uh, closer approach. Parasitized birds tolerate closer approach. So sick animals uh, in, in general uh, tolerate closer approach. FID increases with hunting. So populations that are hunted uh, have greater FIDs than populations that aren't hunted. But what's interesting is the effect size of this is rather small. And there are a whole bunch of other life history and habitat openness effects as well. So what we know is these are decisions that are influenced by a variety of external and internal contextual factors. Uh, colleagues and I did a study of uh, meta-analysis of flight initiation distance in lizards and found similar sorts of things. We found cost of fleeing effects, so food availability and social interactions. We found habitat selection effects, how far individuals are from the refuge or how high they are on perches or how much cover there was. We found experimental effects um, where people manipulated predator density or sequentially attacked animals. We found effects of predatory approach where they modified approach speed or the directness or they looked at an animal while approaching it uh, or they manipulated predator size. And there are physiological effects. Crypsis, ontogeny, prey body size, female reproductive state, um, all sorts of other things influence uh, FID in lizards. But what about tolerance? So one of the things that we see is that different species tolerate approaches differently. How can we explain variation in tolerance? Diego Samia and I um, talked about this for a long time, and we ended up creating a meta-analysis of tolerance, where we define tolerance as the difference between um, one of a number of contrasts. And when I say contrasts, natural or urban, rural versus suburban, rural versus urban. And what we did was we used Hedges G, which is another estimate of effect size, another measure of effect size. And we calculated sort of the standardized effect size of these different contrasts. And what we found was the rural um, versus urban contrast is kind of one of the biggest contrasts, it's contrast there. And this sort of suggested to us that tolerance itself, the ability to tolerate um, an individual or an, uh, humans approaching them or tolerate humans is itself an economic decision. And the type of contrast has the largest effect on the tolerance. Um, when these 95% confidence intervals cross uh, zero, there's no effect. So you know, inside versus outside a reserve, no effect. Um, almost no effect on rural versus suburban, but you know, the biggest is rural versus uh, urban. Different places within a reserve can also have uh, large effects. So then what else explains variation in tolerance across many different species? What we found was body mass had the second largest effect on tolerance. Larger body sized individual species had, uh, were more tolerant, meaning the difference across um, contrast types uh, was bigger if you were a bigger body size species. How do I think about this? How do we think about this? I think what we think, we interpret this as meaning that, or telling us that, that, that big species are flighty and big species are more likely to flee from people. But if big species can live around people, then big species who are paying the cost of fleeing are those that are most likely to become more tolerant and accept closer approaches. Lori Akuda and I did a study where we looked at um, fences. So often people put fences up to uh, restrict access to people. And the question is, 
uh, defenses for security to people. And what we found, what we did was we looked at a place, uh, a wetland in Southern California called Bolsa Chica, and there's an ecotourist area with lots of people. And then part of this wetland also had active oil exploration, oil pumping actually. So there was fenced off and very few people went there. And then we had a control area, which is a place where the uh, United States Pacific Fleet stores all its weapons called Seal Beach, which was a nearby wetland. And very few people go there. And we were able to go there and we were able to compare how birds respond to flushes at these different areas. And what we found for a variety of species we looked at, we found there were no difference between what we called balsa oil and balsa chica, I'm sorry, balsa oil and seal beach, where very few people were. Birds had larger flight initiation distances at these areas, but they tolerated um, a much closer approaches at balsa chica, where many ecotourists were. And the important thing is the difference between balsa oil and balsa chica, it was a contiguous wetland, there's a fence sort of preventing people from going. So fences may afford safety. Birds on one side of the fence respond differently than birds on another side of the fence. Many species typically perceive greater risks when people approach them directly. What about when they approach them tangentially? A tangential approach is instead of approaching directly, um, you know, you're approaching not directly, you're walking by at a tangent to a species. Interestingly, um, in open areas in Argentina, uh, colleagues and I found that a number of species actually were more disturbed with peripheral approaches than direct approaches, even though in many cases, direct approaches are more disturbing. Some birds are more wary when more people approach them. So we walk towards crimson rosellas with two people side by side or two people in a row and compare flight initiation distance to a, a solitary person. And what this is plotting is it's plotting starting distance, the distance we started walking towards the animal and flight initiation distance. And we plot that because there's a predictable relationship between starting distance or alert distance when an animal first looks at you and flight initiation distance. And we found that there was no difference in um, whether two people were side by side or whether two people were in a row, um, but two people led to greater flight initiation distances for any given starting distance than a solitary person approaching these crimson rosellas. Animals generally flush early and avoid the rush. Um, animals generally flush soon-ish after they detect us, which means that if, if we're designing setback zones, we're really interested in when animals are responding to us initially by looking at us. And we suspect this is uh, because there's an ongoing cost of monitoring uh, an approaching threat. If something is coming you know, near me and I have to start looking at it and worrying about, well, should I flush or not flush, I can't focus on other things. So it's probably a low risk thing to do to move away and um, engage in other behaviors at a, at a safe place. So the implications of this sort of corpus of studies are that, first of all, the research has stimulated other studies uh, that have used uh, flight initiations to study life history trade-offs and risk-taking. And uh, I'll say that it's also been a remarkably collaborative and productive international collaboration between me and many, many other people um, who are going out and studying this rather simple behavior to quantify, but then trying to think about evolutionary, ecological, and applied insights that, that emerge from our results. In general, larger birds may be initially vulnerable to human disturbance. Larger birds have greater FIDs, but, um, and, and we, we've been known from an individual-based model that these larger birds, which are more easily disturbed, have lower expected fitness than smaller birds. Being disturbed, if you make some assumptions about it, it interferes with your ability to acquire resources or disturbs you from, uh, interferes with your ability of doing things that are important, this, this strongly suggests that there are costs to being disturbed. But large species that can coexist with humans may end up tolerating them. So this has sort of reframed the question, you know, um, what allows individuals to, individual species and individuals really, to begin to coexist with people in the first place and to study these filtering and tolerance processes.
And it's really hard to do these individual models. I mean, it's easy, it's easy to do an individual based model where you program in a bunch of parameters, but how do you actually estimate those parameters? How do you actually estimate the fitness consequence of being disturbed? That's not easy. And we need more research looking at these sorts of things. So I'm gonna to shift topics a bit and think about anthropogenic noise. And when we think about anthropogenic noise, we um, think about human noise. Um, I'm speaking outside now and there will likely be airplanes and dogs barking and maybe leaf blowers and other sorts of things. But when we think about anthropogenic noise, we, we often think about uh, noise masking or interfering with biologically important signals, that it's hard to communicate in a loud environment, and that if there's a certain consistent frequency with the noise, species may try to communicate over it, as we see with lots of different birds. birds routinely in urban areas shift their um, vocalizations to be higher frequencies, higher pitches, to communicate over traffic noise and urban related noise. Noise can create physiological stress. If you're in a noisy environment all the time, this is physiologically stressful. And this has um, deleterious consequences on um, you know, many species. Noise may also change population distributions. Uh, individuals, and species may move around and, and live in places where there is no noise to avoid noise. And these are all sorts of things that we see. And then the marine mammal literature and the sort of uh, oil exploration and uh, literature where, they, where, they, where people go out and make really loud noises to map the seafloor or where the US Navy makes really loud noises to look for things. Um, these sorts of really loud noises can directly harm animals. So we have a large literature that has shown many of these effects. But noise can do something else as well. Noise can distract animals and make it harder to acquire biologically important information or interfere with adapted decision rules that animals may have. The main point is that any stimulus an animal can perceive is capable of distracting that animal by reallocating part of its finite attention and thus preventing it from responding to an approaching threat. And this is really important because attention is something that animals and humans um, can focus on solving particular problems. And anything that distracts that attention interferes with that decision-making process. So attention is finite and attention can be compromised by stimuli in multiple modalities. So it's not simply noise, if someone over here is, take, is, is, is talking, well, or a bird flies in, or something else happens over here, you may not, you may focus on this rather than listening to me. And by doing so, you're less able to understand what I'm saying. So it turns out that birds and mammals and reptiles and invertebrates all have attentional processes and all focus their attention on relevant stimuli. So, um, students and I uh, did a study where we looked at hermit crabs and we basically started using hermit crabs as a model system to study distraction. And instead of looking at flight initiation distance, we looked at hiding initiation distance because hermit crabs do something pretty cool. When you walk towards a hermit crab, um, they pull up into their shell. We were studying terrestrial Caribbean hermit crabs, but underwater, if you go towards a hermit crab underwater and you get to some, within some distance, it'll retract into its shell. So we did some experiments where we had silence and we had boat motor noise and we walked towards them and we also created a, a process where we could have a silent approach where we had a looming object approach them in the field and then we added multiple modalities we had um, noise versus noise plus a strobe and we had the person walking towards them we ran all these different experiments and what we found is that crabs can be approached more closely when boat noise is broadcast and that's a pretty big um, D score or effect size. So you could get much closer to crabs before they would pull into their shells um, when you were broadcasting boat motor noise. And if we have this looming object, this, this, this um, inflatable thing going towards a crab, we would scare the crabs into their shell. And here too, even if there was no vibration on the ground, we could get closer to them, the looming object could get closer to them if there was boat motor noise being broadcast. And then we, we did the disco party boat experiment where we added a strobe to this whole thing. Um, you could get closer to the crab before it would go into its shell. 
um, with boats and lights compared to boats, suggesting that it doesn't really matter the modality, but these crabs are distracted. And distraction is enhanced by multiple stimuli. And if you think about the modern urban environment, you know, we've got tons of distractors uh, you know, in our modern urban environments. What about cameras? I like ecotourism. You probably like ecotourism. You like to go take pictures of things. So here what we're looking at is um, brown anoles. And it's a playback experiment where we're looking at the change in display rate as a function of a silent playback, meaning no sound, a banana quit, which is a bird that sings constantly in the background in the Caribbean, a kestrel, which is a predator of brown anoles. So what we see is that when we play back the sound of a predator, brown anoles suppress their display rate, significantly so. Very interestingly, when this banana quit, which is a bird that constantly is singing if there aren't predators around, is uh, we play that back, they actually increase their display rate, suggesting they're probably getting some safety information from um, hearing banana quit vocalizations. So then we did a playback experiment where we broadcast the sound of a shutter um, or a shutter plus a flash. And what we found was that interesting, or a flash alone in a multimodal experiment. And what we found was it was the shutter, the sound of a click of a shutter um, that led to a suppressed uh, display rate uh, similar to that as what we found um, when we played back kestrels. So maybe when we take pictures of animals, we love them, we are not trying to hurt them, we're taking pictures, maybe we're distracting them and we're scaring them in some ways. Now, of course, animals habituate to things. Habituation is decline in responsiveness to a stimulus with repeated exposure. Habituation has been studied for millennia. Um, the boy who cried wolf is a story about habituation. But some animals actually sensitize to increased human um, disturbance or visitation. Sensitization is where you have an enhanced responsiveness to a stimulus with a repeated exposure. And I think while people have known these processes forever, um, what we don't know is the sort of ecological and evolutionary drivers or correlates of whether individuals will habituate or sensitize. So what are the conditions under which individuals do one or the other? And how can we begin thinking about this? So let's go back to ecotourism and let's think about dictics, which are a small ungulate. We study them in East Africa at a place where these little ungulates have about 36 species of predators. Typically, you think about ecotourists habituating animals. And I would say that, um, that many species respond to the sounds of the predators and take evasive action. And there's sort of an, an implicit assumption that if animals habituate to humans, maybe this is a bad thing. So what we did was we broadcast the calls of jackals and birdsong within half a kilometer of human habituations um, and to dictics living greater than half a kilometer of human habituation. And if the assumption that many wildlife managers make that um, habituating to humans makes you dumb, if you will, in how you respond to non-humans, uh, to real predators, well then we would expect that the dictics around humans would be, um, you know, would, 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 would ignore the jackal calls. What we found is that um, pretty much any way we looked at it, we found that unhabituated dictics, the ones greater than half a kilometer from humans, uh, were unable to discriminate between the sounds of predators and benign sounds. But the dictics within half a kilometer of humans consistently discriminated and responded more by twitching their noses and smelling for the jackal, by um, reducing their foraging and by increasing their vigilance. Um, and what that said to us was that at these more pristine areas, we as ecotourists were actually scaring the dictics and preventing them from making a very important discrimination about real predators. Whereas when the dictics were habituated to us, when they were living near people and they saw people regularly, they more or less ignored us and could focus more on the actual um, assessing predatory risk. So ecotourists at more pristine places are likely to disturb animals and interfere with their risk assessment, which has all sorts of implications for designing uh, regulations about where and how people should be ecotourists. Turns out this isn't just dictics. 
um, mule deer also, and other species of ungulate that um, we studied in Colorado at my Colorado stub site, uh, study site uh, where I study marmots. Um, near people, uh, they would discriminate. Far from people, they didn't discriminate. I think a lot more research needs to be done to really hone in on what's coming out of this, which I would call really a spatial ecology of fear. But we know that human visitation influences risk assessment in many species. Um, for example, Western gulls. In Los Angeles, there is the, where I live, um, in Santa Monica, there's the Santa Monica Pier. And if you've heard of Venice, California, where all the crazy people are, if you walk from the Santa Monica Pier to Venice, you know, there are a lot of people. Um, and it turns out that Western gulls in this area, uh, flight initiation distance kind of doesn't really vary along this gradient. But if you walk towards Topanga and Malibu, where people start disappearing, where there are, very few, where there are fewer people, what you find is that flight initiation distance increases as you get farther away from the Santa Monica Pier. So even a, a, a physical location with lots of visitors can be something that is a feature that adds structure to really the spatial ecology of, of fear. But not all species habituate. Um, here we're looking at a variety of species in the California chaparral. And what we're finding is, if anything, um, we're finding that species with high human uh, visitation actually flush at greater distances than those with relatively low human visitation. Many of them were, were not significantly different, but the pattern typically was that um, flight initiation distance was greater at high human visitation than low human visitation. Now, what's interesting about this is that um, this area, Chaparral, is, is a very contiguous area, unlike a wetland. So what I showed you before is animals tolerated people um, at, at, at wetlands. Now, in Southern California, there are very few wetlands, so these are remnant habitats. And maybe the idea is that species living in limited habitats, like wetlands, fragments, may be more likely to habituate to people because they have to. And only those species that can habituate will be found there. By contrast, those that live in more contiguous habitat might be more likely to sensitize and you know, will move away, or maybe even suffer consequences from, from the sensitization. So we need to develop a, a greater understanding of the differences, as I said before, between those species that sensitize and those two species that habituate. So habituation is a key to predicting how species will respond to humans. Not all species habituate. The contiguous habitat hypothesis needs to be tested. All of these are testable hypotheses, but the contiguous habitat hypothesis needs to be tested more generally. More stimuli, both in quantity and quality, may be more disturbing, and that a lack of habituation to our stimuli may enhance human impacts on wildlife. So dictics and mule deer are distracted by people. Lizards are distracted by cameras. And I think that the, the spatial scale of habituation or tolerance can be very stark. It can occur on either side of a fence, or it can be gradual and occur, as we saw with Western gulls, over several kilometers. Many prey have more than one predator, and what happens if they lose some? So I did, uh, for a number of years, I was studying uh, tamar wallabies in Australia and other species in Australia as well. And tamar wallabies are unique in that, um, maybe not unique, but they're a good species to study because they evolved with a rich set of um, large lizards that ate them, raptors that ate them, uh, marsupial carnivores that ate them, dingoes clearly ate them, but it really was the introduction of cats and foxes by the Europeans that drove tamars, uh, at least in mainland populations, uh, either extinct or drastically reduced uh, mainland population sizes. So by comparing different populations um, and species with different histories of predation, we can begin to understand what happens when species lose their predators. So I worked on Kangaroo Island where there are no mammalian predators for 9,500 years. Um, worked at Tatani Nature Reserve which had a rich history of mammalian predators. Somehow, um, tamers at Tatani uh, survived this. We worked on Garden Island where there are tamers with no mammalian predators for about 7,000 years. And then we worked in New Zealand where there were no mammalian predators 
really for about 130 years. In fact, the New Zealand animals were brought from a now extinct or historically extinct South Australian population and introduced to New Zealand because the then Governor Gray wanted to have um, some mammals around and wanted some things from Australia. So basically, the New Zealand animals were living in suburbia. They had no predators, whereas the kangaroo animals, the tatanian animals, and probably the tatanian animals had some risk of aerial predation. We know that um, sociality dilutes predation risk, that the probability of being killed by a predator decreases as group size increases. As I like to tell my students in Los Angeles, you know, if you're surfing alone, you've got some probability of being eaten by a shark. If you make the convenient assumption that a shark's only gonna kill one of you, um, as soon as you surf with someone else, you've diluted that by half. And what we often see is the time allocated to vigilance also decreases in this sort of nonlinear way that is um, consistent with what we might call a group size effect and consistent with what, what we infer is driven by the uh, reduction in the risk of predation. Now, the multi-predator hypothesis acknowledges that um, the presence of a single predator will maintain pleiotropic or otherwise linked or integrated anti-predator behavior. Many species have multiple predators. And it's inspired by a series of ideas out there. The ghosts of predators past uh, hypothesis, the pleiotropic hypothesis, and a functional integration hypothesis. And this is an ultimate hypothesis about why we see the persistence of predators. In general, we should not expect any predator behavior to evolve independently. Animals, if they have terrestrial predators and aerial predators, they need to respond to both of them. We shouldn't expect the loss of a terrestrial predator to lead to the loss of all any predator behavior because um, animals still have aerial predators. Reciprocally, if animals have aerial predators, then the loss of terrestrial predators may actually keep um, and uh, 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 the ability to respond to terrestrial predators around. So for example, if you're a young ungulate and you're spotted and your mother leaves you to hide during the day, so crypsis being spotted and being immobile is essential for surviving um, your childhood if you're a small ungulate. If you're spotted but you bounce around, crypsis, if crypsis and immobility are broken apart, that's not a good thing. Similarly, as I said, if you're really good at responding to eagles, but very poor at responding to coyotes, then um, that's a problem later in life. So I think we expect any predator behavior to be linked and for selection to maintain these linkages if there's any benefit from doing so. In other words, as long as species have some predators, we expect package, we expect evolution to select for packages of any predator behavior. So let's test that. And let's test that in um, uh, uh, wallabies and kangaroos, basically. So the multi-predator hypothesis makes this a pretty strong prediction. Animals living with some predators will maintain any predator behavior, while those living without predators will lose it. So garden island animals, you know, they persisted with snakes. And what we're looking at is group size effects, how time allocation changes as a function of changes in group size. Maybe some raptors flying over Garden Island periodically as well. The Tatanian animals evolved with snakes and lizards and aerial and terrestrial predators. They've always had predators. They have strong group size effects. The kangaroo island animals probably have snakes and aerial predators, but they're no mammalian predators. And they have group size effects. In New Zealand, at the time when I studied them, 130 years of relaxed selection basically eliminated no selection for any predator behavior, eliminated group size effects. So this suggests that isolation from all predators has eliminated group size effects in tamar wallabies. There's a bunch of other support for the multi-predator hypothesis. California ground squirrels retain the ability to respond to poisonous snakes, both physiologically and behaviorally. Um, even when populations have been isolated from poisonous snakes for hundreds or even thousands of years. Pronghorn un ungulates run extraordinarily fast despite the extinction of their cursorial predators. Um, they evolved to flee from the North American cheetah, which has been extinct for over 10,000 years, yet pronghorn can still run about 60 miles an hour. Yellow-bellied marmots retain the ability to respond to the sight, the sound, and the smell 
of extinct wolves, despite not having lived with them for probably about 100 years now. Nonetheless, they have to deal with coyotes and foxes and eagles and other raptors. So they've lived in an intact predator community, but they still are able to respond to stimuli associated with extinct wolves. Joel Berger's work on ungulates, where he showed rapid recovery of anti-predator behavior um, following exposure to repatriated carnivores. So when wolves were reintroduced to, Yellow, reintroduced to Yellowstone National Park after their absence for about 75 years, um, individual elk uh, learned very quickly to respond to uh, these wolves after having a bad experience by losing a calf. So um, they didn't lose this ability to uh, respond to, to wolves. Mosquito fish respond to predator archetypes. Archetypes are characteristics of animals that are shared among different things, and mosquito fish respond to predator archetypes. Um, a number of years ago, I sort of scoured the literature. I really need to do this properly. And I found that pretty much most of the studies testing some predictions of the multi-predator hypothesis found at least some support for it in mammals and birds and reptiles and fishes. So I think there's a variety of support for the multi-predator hypothesis. I think it needs testing, of course. What are its limits? It implies that the costs of responding without a predator are similar to all predators, and this is unlikely. There's some predators where it's very costly to respond to them, and if those predators aren't there, um, animals facing a large cost may wish to minimize that cost. Are there, related to that, are there effects of loss of different sorts of predators, aerial versus terrestrial, sit and wait versus pursuit? Is the time course of loss really rapid once all predators are gone? And we need to know this because if we bring animals into captivity to breed them for later reintroduction, as we say we do with zoos, then is that really bad? Is that isolating animals from the very predators they need to survive? And we'll talk about that a bit in a moment. Does the mechanism matter? Do we expect different responses for learned versus more canalized and predator behaviors? And how important are predator archetypes? More work needs to be done on this. And then importantly, I would say a strong prediction of this is there should be a co-variation between different anti-predator responses. And that means there sh we should be able to identify quantitative genetics underlying this, and we should be able to identify, um, in, in terms of real genetics, we should be able to identify the genes responsible for these should be on the same chromosomes. So as we develop better genomic tools, there are strong predictions from the multi-predator hypothesis in terms of the architecture, the genomic architecture of anti-predator behavior. Take home message is it's predictive and testable, and I believe that it's the loss of all, not some predators, that increases the species vulnerability. Alex Carthy and I spent a while thinking about this, um, this important feature of our modern world, basically, um, and trying to develop more uh, predictive, more, more prediction, more, a more predictive model of anti-predator behavior. And we recognize that species may have ecological and evolutionary experience with um, currently extant native predators. They may have evolutionary experience only if, 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 if species have been extinct. They may have no experience with predators. Um, and they may have ecological experience only. And an example of this is if we look at um, Australia, I mean, Australia has the world's worst recent record of mammalian extinction. And many of these extinctions have been driven by the introduction, introduction of uh, foxes and cats. And these placental predators are predators that many species have had no experience with. Now they've evolved with a rich history of exposure to marsupial predators and marsupial carnivores, but it really was the introduction of foxes and cats that led to the extinction of many species in Australia. So that leads us to developing um, a more integrative way of thinking about this and thinking about the archetypes and thinking about the scents that are produced by different types of predators, thinking about what they look like. So a thylacine kind of looks like a, you know, a wolf, kind of looks like a dingo, but thylacines and dingoes smell different. And you know, the cues that animals are using to identify predators may be very important. So we need to understand how animals perceive predators. And then we can think about 
Um, can we provide experience? Does experience bootstrap things? Does experience recover lost anti-predator behavior? And we can think about various mechanisms underlying this, and um, et cetera. So this leads to uh, various anti-predator responses. So let's say animals can discriminate between predators and non-predators. Do they have a response that's inappropriate or is it an optimal response? One thing that always struck me with uh, tamar wallabies is we've done a lot of work that I didn't talk about now showing that they can recognize predator cues. We can train them. This is work with Andrea Griffin, who's up at Newcastle, where we can train them to be more responsive to predator cues. They can train themselves because it can be socially transmitted, Andrea has demonstrated. But if they don't have the appropriate response for dealing with a fox, say, then that inappropriate response will prevent them from having a good outcome. So Alex and I came up with this schema for thinking about these various scenarios, which um, we think can, needs testing, but also can uh, allow us to begin to think about um, the situation that species may face themselves and then sort of frame the problem for reintroducing animals to the wild. Many of these reintroductions, as I've said several times, have failed. And as I just said, Australia has the worst record of recent mammalian extinction. Um, you know, many of the animals have gone extinct around the world, have done so in Australia, and that um, there are estimates that feral foxes and cats kill an estimated 75 million native animals each night. Um, feral cats are estimated to kill between 169 and 508 million birds per year. So Catherine Mosby and Mike Letnick and I got together and developed this idea um, that came from really Catherine's insight, which is maybe instead of trying to train animals, maybe instead of just letting animals be naive and putting them out, we need to try to select for better animals. We need to build better Australian mammals by letting them live with predators and taking the survivors um, who survive uh, and, and then maybe they're going to do better. So this has all sorts of interesting ethical implications. It has all sorts of interesting logistic implications. And Catherine and Mike and I um, have been studying this for um, about six, seven years now. And what we've been working with is we've been exposing um, burrowing bedongs and bilbies to low densities of cats for you know, six years. And this exposure to these, this predator um, permits learning and it may permit also natural selection. And we've been doing this at this remarkable um, experiment uh, and a remarkable study site uh, called Arid Recovery, which is near Roxby Downs in South Australia. Roxby Downs is a 123 square kilometer uh, fenced reserve that has a cat proof fence surrounding it. And it's divided into paddocks of various sizes it's in the arid zone. It's divided into paddocks of various sizes. And some of these paddocks are huge, you know, 26, 27, 32 square kilometers. And into these paddocks, we introduced um, cats. And um, we have basically, and then we introduced, we have bilbies and bedongs living with cats in some of these areas. Our cast of characters includes feral cats, burrowing bedongs, greater bilbies. There are some quolls that have been recovered there as well. Stick nest rats, the reserve has been trying to recover as well. Um, and soon we're gonna be playing around with dingoes um, in these paddocks as well. But we started with cats. And we started with cats because not all cats are bed on or bilby killers, some are. And we thought we could put in low densities of cats and have some predation, but it wouldn't be so much predation that would drive these extinct. Now bedongs have been driven extinct already on mainland um, Australia. The bedongs that um, Catherine brought back into arid recovery had come from islands off Western Australia. Bilby's population size has been drastically reduced in Australia, um, exists in the Northwest. Um, bilbies were brought back to a, an area where they were formerly extinct, which is the arid recovery area. What we found over a number of years is that bedongs and bilbies were able to coexist with cats. Um, our control area is an area um, where we had no cats, just bedongs and bilbies, and our uh, 
cat area is an area where we had low densities of cats. And we weren't sure whether this would work or not, but we actually had over a number of years coexistence and actually not just coexistence, reproduction. Meaning that we had, in addition to our founders, we had more animals um, being produced in these areas. So not only were these animals coexisting with a species implicated in driving them extinct, but um, these animals are able to reproduce and the population was able to grow. It grew quite well for a number of years living with populations of cats. They can coexist and reproduce with cats and we're sort of tracking the number of cats here and we can see that um, we're looking at track counts and bed on populations are doing quite well even as we increase the number of cats. If you had too many cats we had problems but for a number of years um, we were having um, coexistence and increase. We also looked at um, uh, how these animals responded to a variety of tests of any predator behavior. So we came up with a way to look at flight initiation distance and what we found is that bedongs have become more wary over time uh, in areas where they lived with cats, more wary to us. So there was seemingly some selection for greater wariness towards threats, selectively in the area where they were living with cats, not in the control area. We found that bedongs learned to discriminate between models of cats and uh, ben benign things. Um, there were no real differences in terms of high vigilance in areas um, uh, with no cats, but in areas with cats, they uh, started responding more uh, with high vigilance to uh, taxidermic mounts of cats. We also found ultimately that we took animals from these areas with cats in our control areas predator exposed and predator free, and we put them to another area with predators. So we did a designed translocation, and we found um, remarkably that bilby survival was enhanced after living in areas with cats. So cat exposed bilbies did better when reintroduced. We did this twice for bedongs, um, at low cat density, at high cat density. Um, we were having a drought during this whole time, and we found there was no effect on bedong survival either at high or low cat densities, which is interesting. At least one species living with cats, our in situ predator exposure has prepared them to do better um, when translocated to an area with cats, but potentially not for the other species. So a lot more work has to be done, and this is just a, a brief overview of, of, of much more intensive work that we have done, showing that there's a suite of behavioral and morphological changes, and that at least Bilbies do better um, after having been exposed to cats. So a bunch of conclusions here to wrap up. Um, we need to develop mechanistic models to predict how animals respond to humans. And I think I've suggested ways that we can do that. We can use flight initiation distance as a metric to gain insight into how animals perceive risk and perceive risks associated with us. Um, anthropogenic stimuli may distract animals in addition to all the other things that anthropogenic stimuli do and anthropogenic noise does, and it may enhance vulnerability to predators. And this has consequences for managing areas and managing anthropogenic stimuli. Not all animals may habituate to disturbances, and we need to know the conditions of habituation versus sensitization. We need to understand more, uh, we need to do more studies looking at uh, really the natural history of tolerance and the natural history of habituation and uh, sensitization. The presence of any predators may maintain any predator behavior, even for extinct predators, and the multi-predator hypothesis um, makes some predictions about that. And then I think we've shown we may be able to inculcate fear into fearless populations, and at least for some species, this may increase their survival upon reintroduction. So we're gaining tools um, to increase wildlife management successes by understanding behavior. And I think all of these ideas can be applied, but we really need to think about applying them and evaluating them much as we are with our Bilby Bedong work. Um, in the context of adaptive management, we need to ask if they, if they make, if they have an effect, and if they have an effect, how big is that effect, and, and how costly is it to ultimately do that? 
So coming back full circle to this idea of bench to bedside research, one thing that's important in biomedical research is that we need to do what's called comparative effectiveness evaluation. So just because we have a whole series of interesting behavioral tools, are they expensive or are they not expensive? And comparatively, how expensive are they compared to other sorts of alternatives? I think what I've shown is that we have a variety of possible ways that any predator behavior and knowledge of any predator behavior and thinking about behavioral mechanisms can inspire experiments to better understand wildlife conservation and management questions and taken together, I think um, it's the application of behavior that can have important uh, implications for wildlife um, conservation and management. And with that, uh, I'm going to end and say thank you for listening. And if I were here live, I would be answering your questions, but unfortunately, um, this is going to be Memorex, not live. Thank you very much.